lesson to part B. Dr. Ken with you here. So about this lesson, we're going to outline the effects of electrical current and the uses for each effect. So in lesson A, we looked at how we produce those electrical currents. Now we're going to look at how we use them. So from the uh, textbook, Electrical Principles by Phillips, this is section 2.2 .2 if you want to have a look at some of the other pictures and some of the text there. So effects caused by an electric current include heating. Almost always you're going to have heating. The only time you're not going to have heating is if you happen to be using a superconductor that has no resistance. Otherwise, you'll always have a heating effect. You will always, no matter what kind of conductor you're using, there'll be some form of magnetism going on. Sometimes, but not always, you can have chemical effects, mostly when we're using battery cells. And, of course, there can be luminous effects where a current emits a light. And finally, a physiological effect. Our bodies are made up of bioelectrical systems. And if we come into contact with too much other electrical current, we can have huge problems. So the first one we're going to look at is heating. So in heating, we're looking at the current flow through a heater element of some kind. And Here's our heater element, pretty obvious, and it's producing radiant heat here. So this is normally a tungsten element, it's made of tungsten. And the reason we use tungsten is we can actually make it quite hot without melting it. So tungsten has a very high melting point. But you'll also notice something else coming off here. Even though there's lots of heat, we've also got a little bit of light. There's a little bit of light coming off the heater. So as the element gets hot, it glows and a little bit of light is given off. So all heater elements tend to give off a little bit of light, even though the light's unintentional. It's not part of what we want. We want mostly the heat. So heat is developed when current passes through a resistance. And as I mentioned, it's a tungsten element usually. The next one is magnetism. A basic application of the magnetic effect is the electromagnet, which has a coil of wire wound around a soft iron core. When the current uh, flows in the coil, the iron core becomes magnetized or turns into an electromagnet. And a common use of an electromagnet is a device called a relay. So here's a picture of, of a relay. I'll just quickly uh, turn my pen on again. And this is our coil of wire here. So I've got a big coil of wire here. And if we want to pass some current through here, we're going to produce a magnetic field here. And if we produce a magnetic field there, the armature it's called here, this little thing in here, it's the armature, this will close. So the magnetic field will call that to cause that to close. And of course, if that closes, then the contacts close. So we can use a small amount of current here. I'll just use a small lowercase i. And it allows a large i to flow when it's closed. So that's what's happening over here in the second diagram. You can see here our armature has closed, therefore our contact has closed. A large amount of current is now flowing to this heater element indicated by the red arrows. And so we've used a small voltage here to get a larger voltage or a larger current flow. So in a sense, a relay is a form of amplifier. It's a digital amplifier because it's either on or it's off, but that's what it does. 
you can use a small current or a small voltage to switch a much larger one. Other applications for magnetic effect are things like a uh, power transformers, of course these uh, AC devices and uh, this tra zone transformer here will be have a primary winding and a secondary winding and there'll be some kind of soft iron core in between and I can tell from the size of the insulators here we're probably coming in at something like 330 volts and we're going out at 132 kV kilovolts so coming in at 330 kV going out at 132 so it's a step down transformer and the only reason this device works is because we're using alternating current I just put the alternating current sign there magnetic fields are going up and down up and down up and down cutting the conductors because of the alternating field and you get this mutual induction it's called and the transformer can be used to step voltages down or up the next one is our motor and we can connect three phases to these terminals here and because the three phases are actually alternating at a different rate from each other we can create a rotating magnetic field and that rotating magnetic field is then used in turn to rotate the shaft of the motor and we turn electrical energy in back into mechanical energy so a transformer takes electrical energy and converts it into electrical energy or transforms it as its name implies but a motor converts electrical energy back into mechanical energy our chemical effect of course this is where we're going to be playing with batteries and things we're going to look at uh, different kinds of cells in the next lesson our current can flow in liquids called electrolytes because an electrolyte contains ions these are atoms with positive or negative charges and uh, if this can be a little bit counterintuitive so it's worth taking note positive ions have less electrons so it sounds a bit counterintuitive but that's the way it is positive ion has less electrons and a negative ion has more electrons so in the middle here you can see we've got four protons one two three and four but we've got one two three four five so we're up, up by plus one making this guy negative here we've got four protons over this side again same four but we've got one two three so we're down by one minus one down so this is a positive iron my very rough positive symbol and where can this be helpful well it could be helpful in electrolysis um, in this particular case we've got an example where we're using positive ions to move the cathode to the negative ions towards the anode and uh, making purified copper so again in here we have some copper with contaminated so cu is a symbol for copper copper plus impurities on this side and if we put a current through that impure copper the copper will transfer via the electrolyte solution and the pure copper will be deposited on the cathode and the impurities will be left behind and some of the impurities will actually go into suspension also in the electrolyte and end up in the bottom of the tank they just physically fall out so this is a great way to purify copper we just use electrolysis by passing electrical current through the impure copper and the pure copper gets deposited on the cathode the other place we use it is electroplating so the main use of electroplating is to protect materials against corrosion so you might be plating silver onto say um, soft iron to protect it 
So the part to be plated is connected to the negative or to the cathode and the anode is made of metal to be plated onto the part and both components are immersed in the electrolyte. Current flowing through the electrolyte causes ions to flow from one from the anode to the cathode and you end up plating the cathode with whatever it is, the material that you've got on the anode. Galvanic corrosion is an interesting one. This is where you get uh, an electrolyte, but you get dissimilar metals. So corrosion occurs between a voltaic effect in which two dissimilar metals and the electrolyte form an electric cell. This is normally happens particularly in seawater, where seawater is salty water, it's a great electrolyte. The current produced by the cell causes the metal to corrode, with one of the metals corroding before the other. So to limit the corrosion, we use a thing called a sacrificial anode is put in place and in contact with the metal being protected. So you can see here a probably a drilling rig of some kind out at sea and you can see that we have uh, sacrificial anodes that have been welded in place all over the place. So you can see them here, there's lots of them in this picture. Lots and lots of them, I just, you know, circle a couple of them. You can see a few of them, but they're everywhere. These two big ones in the foreground are really obvious. And these are zinc. The reason they use zinc is, zinc is lower or more reactive than iron. So the structure's made of this stuff. So this is the structure. It's made of iron, but we're going to use zinc and bolt it to it. And as the galvanic effect happens, so rather than try and plate the entire structure in, say, silver to protect it, we use some sacrificial anodes instead. And the seawater, when it comes in and reacts with the steel, it will eat away at the sacrificial anode rather than eating away at the steel because zinc is more reactive than iron. So luminous effect is the next one. Light is produced by passing an electric current through certain types of gases which ionizes and creates plasma. An example of this is the fluorescent lamp or the fluoro tube. Um, it has mercury vapor gas and as the gas um, ionizes it produces UV light. Of course that UV light then goes through the phosphorus on the inside of the tube and gets converted into white light. Also, a light emitting diode, an LED, produces light by way of what is called the electroluminescence effect, which is caused by electrons releasing energy in the form of photons or light as it goes across a PN or a diode junction. So here's our light emitting diodes. Um, the first diodes ever created um, in the mid-70s. Um, were the red ones, they were pretty easy to produce and about 10 or 15 years later we kind of moved from red to green to yellow all the way up to blue, blue being the hardest colour to produce and as you can see they come in a variety of colours, shapes and of course now we also have white light LEDs. So LEDs operate from a low DC voltage and current they have a long life and can maintain a constant light output for a long, long time. Physiological effect, we'll go into a little bit of this and some more of this in the next lesson. Um, your body is very, very much built around a bioelectrical system. Your brain has a bioelectrical system for remembering things in synapses. Your heart has a bioelectrical system with your lungs that operates automatically to keep you breathing and your circulation working. And you have a bioelectrical system for feeling uh, pressure and heat within your skin. So there are many bioelectrical systems in your body. So this physiological effect is the effect is caused by passing a current through a living organism. Um, first thing to note is blood is a good conductor because your blood is largely water, but it's contaminated from an electrical perspective. 
uh, by plasma and other chemicals, making it a great conductor. Current flowing through a human interferes with the body's bioelectrical nervous system. And the effect on a human depends on how much current flows and the path that it takes through your body. So there's two things that we really, really need to um, take note of here is how much current and the path that it takes. These are critical to how your body will cope with having electricity pass through it inadvertently. So current in the human body, um, this is an interesting little table and worth taking particular note. Up to two milliamps, barely perceivable. Um, if you've ever taken a 1.5 volt cell and touched it on your, between your tongue and your finger, you might have felt a slight little tingle to indicate whether the battery's got a little bit of life left in it or not. That's around the two milliamp thing, barely perceivable, not gonna do you any harm. Once we get up to eight milliamps, uh, the sensation becomes obvious. It's more than just a tingle and you're actually now starting to feel you know, some level of pain. We get up to 12 milliamps and um, muscles begin to spasm and you, you know that you've got pain. At um, 20 milliamps, you're unable to let go of conductors. You can't control your muscles anymore. The electrical energy passing through your body has got control, not you and you have a lot of pain. At 50 milliamps, if it's passing through your chest, your breathing is probably going to stop. So the first thing that's going to be affected is your breathing. At 100 milliamps, particularly if it's near the heart, we'll get ventricular fibrillation it's called, ventricular fibrillation. In other words, your heart doesn't stop in the true sense, it just starts to vibrate very quickly. Unfortunately, it's not pumping very much, if anything at all. At the uh, 200 milliamp, your heart stops. And of course, the only way we're gonna get you back up and breathing and operating is some CPR. So you're a CPR candidate if this happens. And then above 200 milliamps, not only are you a CPR candidate, but you're in for severe burns. Now the burns may be external, where the uh, electricity has entered and exited your body, but the really difficult thing is the internal burning. If you've burnt your heart muscle or your lung muscles in the process, then unfortunately, uh, more than likely, death will pursue. So that's the end of uh, lesson two, part B. Uh, we talked about the effects of an electrical current in lesson A. We looked at what we use, uh, the energy sources we use to produce voltage potential. But having created a potential, once we've got current flowing, we looked at what effects current have. So I hope you've enjoyed looking at the effects of current. And we'll take that a little bit further in part C.